Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. <laughs> My concern when we come to a passage like this is that people will respond like Vinick did in that clip there. Before they even think what the passage actually says, they'll kind of react with disgust. They'll say, slaves, obey your masters. That sounds so wrong. That sounds so outdated. And I know many of my non-Christian friends and many of my Christian friends as well have a problem with verses like slaves, obey in everything, those who are your earthly masters. Because we think, look, we live in the 21st century. We know slavery is wrong. It's, It's abysmal. And the Bible seems to condone it. And people have an issue with that. I'm sure many of the people who have been on Alpha courses will have heard those kinds of questions again and again. How can you tell me to read a Bible that's so culturally outdated? It's this stuff that we, you know, here in the 21st century know is wrong. How do you expect me to trust this book? I want to tell you today what the Bible does actually say about slavery. Because my concern is that people will react negatively. Maybe even some of you thought, oh, that's tough. (laughs) Slaves obey your masters. And the easy thing to do is to react in disgust and say, oh, I don't like that. And eventually people chuck out the whole Bible. Like Vinick, he said, I struggled for a long time with that book. Finally, I just gave up the struggle. My hope is today that we won't give up the struggle, but we will learn how to handle this tough text in Colossians 3. Does that sound okay? You're suddenly a little bit subdued. (laughs) Oh, gosh. (laughs) I'm the one that should look terrified. There are 27 million slaves in the world today. 27 million. We can often think slavery is an old problem. It's not. It's very much a modern problem. There are more slaves in the world today than at any other point in history. Isn't that shocking? You know, as preachers, when we say something rousing and exciting, we love it when people go, amen, hallelujah, because we like to see you react to things. When I say something shocking, I also want you to kind of go, okay, 27 million people in the world today. It's okay to look disgusted. It is abysmal. 27 million. How much do you reckon is the average price to buy a slave across the world today? Any suggestions? Average price to buy a person to act as your slave. Sorry? 100 US US dollars. Was that close? Close. Any other suggestions? Actually, it's just below that. It's about 90 US dollars. It's 45 pounds to buy and own a person, to own their body, their their rights to everything they do. 45 pounds to own a person. That is abysmal. In fact, just this week in the BBC, it was uh, reported that a a slave... um, a slave ring in the UK was kind of infiltrated and, and unearthed, and over 500 people have been arrested in the last six months for slave trading in England. It's very easy to think slavery doesn't really happen here, but it very much does. Slaves, obey your masters. What does the Bible say about this tricky subject? Well, the Bible has actually a great deal to say about slavery. The only thing is, if you look through your Bibles in the New Testament, very often you won't notice the word slave. And the reason for that is this, about 124 times, I'll get the stats out of the way and then we'll move on to proper, you know, preaching. About 124 times in the New Testament, a Greek word, the word is doulos, is used. But the majority of times in the New Testament, it's translated as servant rather than slave despite the fact it distinctly means slave. So if you look through your New Testament again and again and again, you will find the word servant with a little footnote. And if you read the footnote, it will say, or bond servant, or in some translations, or slave. 124 times in the New Testament, the Bible explicitly talks about slavery, but we read servant. I think I can understand why the translators have done that, because if you read the Bible and you keep coming across the word slave, you're going to think, I don't like the fact that the Bible talks so much about slavery. Because when we think about slavery, not to be too crass about it, but we think of uh, uh, images of black people being bundled into ships against their will, shipped across the world to another country that dominates them, and then sold to some wealthy person and made to pick cotton or do horrendous things, treated abysmally and eventually dying in the job. And so if you read the word slave again and again and again in your New Testament, you're probably going to think, I don't like that. So the translators have put servant with a little footnote. 
But actually, that can mask the fact that the Bible has an enormous amount to say about slavery. It's important to note that the Bible never condones nor condemns slavery. We can always think that actually the Bible thinks that slavery is wrong. It it never out and out says slavery is a sin. Does that surprise you? The Bible never out and out says slavery is a sin, but neither does it say it is a God-given and glorious, wonderful thing. God never says, I want you to have slaves and have lots of them because I delight in slaves. It never condones nor condemns slavery. But what we've got to realize is that the kind of slavery that Paul is talking about, he doesn't write to this guy and say, masters, set, your free, set free all your slaves. He says, no, 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 masters and slaves, you've got to work in this particular way. The kind of slavery that Paul is talking about in the first century is very, very different to the kind of slavery that we think about. So when we hear the word slave, we come up with all sorts of different connotations that are not necessarily there in first century slavery. And so we're going to talk a little bit about slavery in the first century, how it differed from the kind of slavery we think of today. That's our first point. Then we're going to think about slavery in Colossians 3. I'll come back and we'll look at the text we just read. And then thirdly, we're going to think of slavery as a metaphor in the Christian life. Now, if it feels a bit hard going, uh, try and stay with me. This first section, uh, you might think, okay, that's just you know, lots of facts and figures. But it is foundational for everything else that we're going to look at this morning. We need to understand that the slavery Paul is talking about is worlds apart from the kind of slavery that we think of. Because otherwise we'll run into all sorts of trouble and we'll all respond like Vinnick there and kind of disgust and say, I don't like that. And eventually it may lead to us doubting our Christian faith. Does that sound okay? That's where we're going. You can smile. (laughs) Excellent. Okay, slavery in the first century. I want to go through a few uh, ways in which slavery in the first century was very different to modern slavery. Slavery in the first century was not primarily based on race. So when we think about slavery today, we think, and and rightly so, because this is what happens in the modern world. Very often, a powerful nation, okay, now I'm not picking on America, but this is an obvious example. A powerful nation like America would uh, get people from a weaker nation, okay, what they consider to be a weaker nation. They would get them and ship them in and make them do their work, all the horrible work they don't want to do. One weaker nation being dominated by a powerful nation. And that's what we think about when we think of slavery. First century slavery was not like that. Romans could have Roman slaves. Greek could have Greek slaves or Roman slaves or Jewish slaves or whatever. It wasn't simply the case that one powerful nation subjected a weaker nation to slavery. Modern slavery is incredibly racist. It really is. So much trafficking is done where people are taken from one country to another. It is highly racist. It's all about one powerful country subjecting another pa- uh, like weaker country to slavery. And first century slavery is totally, utterly different. This is shocking. When the American founding fathers spoke about slaves, they believed that the black slaves that they were importing were only 60% human. Isn't that shocking? They believed they were 60% human. Therefore, they only deserve 60% human rights. That is abysmal. And we can't read things like slaves obey your masters as if God is endorsing that kind of racism. God absolutely does not endorse that racism. When God created man, he created man and woman in his own image. Male and female, black and white, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, all human beings are made in God's image. We cannot assume that God, because he says slaves obey your masters, happily endorses racism. Say this after me, nice and loud. God is not a racist. Amen. But the problem with guys like Vinnick is that he reads things like slaves, submit to your masters, as if God is happily condoning all the stuff that the American founding fathers were doing. That is not, not true in the slightest. God is not a racist. Secondly, First century slavery was not based on social status. Very often in the first century, a slave could have higher education than their master. They could be more highly educated. In fact, they could have far higher responsibilities than their master and many of the people in the free world. So for example, if you were a slave in the household of Caesar, you could essentially be in charge of administrating the whole Roman Empire as a slave. They weren't given just the menial tasks. They actually had high positions of responsibility. That is incredible. It's totally different to modern slavery. In fact, and this is a bit weird and a bit of a sort of uh, a mind shift, slaves could often own slaves in the first century. 
Isn't that weird? It wasn't the case that society was made of like two tiers where you've got the masters up here and the slaves down there and that's all there was. Actually, a slave could own another slave. You could be a slave to a master but also be a master to another slave. That's weird. But the social status was utterly different in the first century. It wasn't the case that if you were a slave, you were the absolute lowest of the low. You could hold positions of authority. And in fact, this caused problems for the guys in the church. So... Um, I'd like to get some people up the front. Is Ben Travis here? Ben Travis here? He's not here. Okay, uh, I'll have my mum instead. Make a note of that. Ben Travis is not here. <laughs> um, tick him off. Ben, uh, mum, come up the front. And Tom Shaw, if you could come up the front as well. And Bridget Bree, if you could come up the front as well. Tom and my mum, if you could stand over this side. And Bridget, you can stand over this side. Now, you're going to love this bit. And uh, <laughs> Bridget's family, I want to hear a big cheer when I say this. Here's a sound bite for you. Bridget Bree is a slave driver. <laughs> Even Simon agrees. There you go. Bridget Bree is a slave driver, and she owns um, three slaves, one of whom is not with us today, presumably because he's, I don't know, doing some kind of work. And uh, Bridget owns these slaves, my mum and Tom Shaw. Actually, if she owned my mum, she'd probably own me as well. But, you know, forget that bit of the metaphor. Okay, Bridget owns these people, and, uh, and Bridget spends all week long telling them what to do, because that's what masters do. And all week long, they obey. Can I just grab that microphone for a second? Slaves, how do you feel having Bridget as your master? She's very hard. <laughs> I can believe that. How do you feel about that? Horrified. Horrified, indeed. <laughs> but the thing is, Bridget and my mum and Tom Shaw are all Christians. And uh, it's important to note this. The church in Colossae who are receiving this letter, it's assumed that the masters Paul is talking to and the slaves that Paul is talking to are both within the church. They're both Christians. There were slave Christians. There were masters who were Christians within the church. That's a bit weird, isn't it? And Paul tells them how to get along. Now imagine Bridget spends her whole entire week bossing these people around because that's what, you know, masters do. And then suddenly Bridget goes to cell group on Thursday. Now cell groups are our midweek groups where we gather together, we worship, we have fellowship, we study the word together. And we have cell leaders. Who is Bridget's cell leader? Actually, it's Ben Travis who's not here. What a bad example to set. Um, but suddenly Bridget has, has to respond to Ben's leadership. All week long, he's been the slave, she's been the master. Suddenly, she has to do what Ben tells her to do. In fact, who should be visiting the cell that week? But my mum, who is their cell overseer. She makes sure everything is running smoothly. And I don't know why I'm using this. I got one strapped to my face. That's a bit weird. <laughs> Just went into autopilot there. I can't get used to it. Um, so yeah, suddenly, Bridget goes from being the master to my mum being the slave to actually my mum being in the position of authority because the slave and master relationship was not recognized in the church. And then Bridget, who currently looks terrified, um, comes to church on Sunday. And who is her pastor? None other than Tom Shaw. And the roles are totally reversed. Slaves can actually have high positions of authority within the church. Totally different to modern slavery. Imagine the temptation for my mum or Tom Shaw or, or Ben Travis if uh, Bridget's given him a hard time that week to, to you know, get revenge. <laughs> Imagine... Tom saying, oh, we need someone to go out on the car parking team. And hey, it looks like it's raining. Off goes Bridget. Uh, imagine Ben saying, oh, yeah, uh, I didn't sort anyone to do the W's this week at Cell. Bridget can do them all. Imagine the <laughs> temptation to wreak revenge on Bridget. This is the kind of thing that actually the, f the first century church would have been struggling with. Thank you, Bridget. You can go back to your seat. And you can't. You can come over here. And Tom, if you could stay there for just a moment. Thirdly. First century slavery was not primarily based on finance. Okay, now a lot of people would get into slavery because of debt. Okay, they owed a debt, they couldn't pay it, and so they would sell themselves into slavery in order to pay off the debt. That's fine. But just because you were a slave in the first century didn't mean you were necessarily going to remain poor forever. Okay, so in this example, my mum is a slave and Tom is a, a free worker in the Roman world. He's just got a standard job. He's not a slave. He's just a general worker. Now, Tom earns quite a lot of money per year and he's going to get it paid to him in chocolate, uh, <laughs> which he cannot eat until he's left the stage. Tom, here you go. You get 313 denarii Ooh. for a whole year's work. I mean, that's not bad. 313 denarii. He's practically rolling in it. My mum, as a slave... You get 60 denarii for an entire year's work. Five denarii a month, 60 denarii. Whose wage are you more likely to want? Tom's or my mum's? Tom's. 
you're going to want the 313 denarii, not 60 denarii. But factor this into the equation. Tom has to pay for his accommodation. He has to pay for his food. He has to pay for his clothing. That's going to cost him 280 denarii a year. So I'm going to take most of that back and leave you with a total of 33 denarii. It's a bit rubbish, isn't it? My mum, on the other hand, as a slave, her master pays for her accommodation, pays for her food, pays for her clothing. She has no outgoings at all. At the end of the year, she's left with 60 denarii. Tom has 33 denarii. My mum, the slave, ends up with pretty much double the amount of savings of the Roman free worker. Isn't that odd? That's how it works in the first century. <laughs> You're stealing all my coins. <laughs> okay, you can go back to your seats and you can take your denarii with you. And if anyone else wants a denarii, it's coming up. There we go. <laughs> Rob wants all the denarii. You greedy man. <laughs> okay. In the first century, you could make a lot of money, and this is odd, but people could actually sell themselves into slavery because they saw it as a viable way of making money. Totally alien to our modern conception of what slavery is. Utterly different. This leads me on to our fourth point. First century slavery was not for life. Because a slave could earn 60 denarii that would just be savings to him throughout the year, he had no outgoings, he could very quickly earn enough money to buy his own freedom. If you owed a particular amount of money, you could go at the end of the year and say, I've got this amount of savings here, I want to put that towards buying my freedom. And it is expected that a slave in the first century would not remain in slavery for longer than 10 to 15 years maximum. Totally different to modern slavery. In fact, it is extremely rare that a slave in the first century remained in slavery beyond the age of 30. That's incredible. That's not bad, is it? You could very easily buy yourself out of slavery in the first century. Or you would earn enough respect from your master that they would say, you've served me well, I'll let you go. In fact, sometimes the government just declared emancipation for all slaves and you'd be set free. It is extremely rare to be a slave in the first century beyond the age of 30. Look at the modern world. The majority of slaves would die in their jobs. It's horrendous. A world's apart. First century slavery and modern slavery. Have you got the point? Totally, utterly different. So when we read things like slaves obey your masters, we mustn't think of this modern idea of what slavery is like. We've got to operate with a totally different understanding of the term slavery. And that's what I've been trying to, uh, to communicate now. And I think this is foundational for everything. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that slavery was a pleasant thing, okay? It was never a pleasant thing to be owned by someone else. Never. I'm not saying that first century slavery was great. It's still horrible to be owned by someone. And I think actually, fundamentally, God would say it's not great to be owned by someone at all. That's why in 1 Corinthians 7, he says, if you're a slave, but you have the opportunity to get free, get free. Because it's not good to be owned by someone else. You, you belong to the Lord. Slavery is never pleasant, but it's utterly different. And loads of the negative connotations of modern slavery are just nowhere to be found in first century slavery. In fact, the Bible does have some negative things to, be, uh, to say about slavery. You know, Vinnick said the Bible doesn't have a problem at all with slavery. It extremely does. It really does. If you read 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, you'll find a long list of sins. And right in the middle, it says enslavers. If you look to the footnote for the definition, it says those who take someone captive in order to sell him into slavery. The Bible calls it a sin to capture someone, to take them captive against their will and sell them into slavery. In fact, if you go back to Exodus 21, you've got the same story. In verses 26 and 27, it talks about how you treat your slaves. It says if you beat your slave and you damage their eye, you've got to let them go because that's not on. God doesn't say don't have slaves at all, but he says if you do have slaves, you've got to treat them well. But if you go back a couple of verses, it says this in verse 16 of Exodus 21. Whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. The Bible has an enormous problem with slavery that comes about through kidnapping. And surprise, surprise, that is the, the biggest way that slavery is funded today. By people being kidnapped against their will or tricked into slavery, promised a great job in a foreign country, put on a boat, taken to this foreign country, only to find that actually they're being sold as sex slaves in a, a foreign nation. The majority of slaves today are slaves through trickery, through kidnapping, and horrible practices that the Bible call sinful. And in fact, the Old Testament says should be punished by death. 
So when Vinick says the Bible doesn't have a problem at all with slavery, I want to say to him, okay, first of all, first century slavery is utterly different to the kind of slavery you're thinking about. But second of all, the Bible has a massive problem with modern slavery for those reasons that I've just explained and more. So when we hear 27 million people in slavery today, more than at any other time in history, I'm going to think the Bible has a big problem with that. It's not right just to say the Bible seems to be happy about slavery. It isn't at all. And I hope and pray that justice is done and those 27 million people are set free because it is wrong and God thinks it's wrong. And he says (laughs) in very stark language that it is wrong. So let's come back to Colossians 3. The reason I spent so long on that is because it is foundational. I want us to be operating with the right mindset. And when we come to Colossians 3, it says, Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Leave aside the modern picture of slavery. Forget Uncle Tom's Cabin and films like Amazing Grace. It's nothing like that at all. Totally different. Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. I think what Paul is tackling here is people who have become Christians and then thought, well, what do I do now? Do I stay a slave or do I have to give away my slaves or what? And Paul says, actually, it's not right just to go, hey, I'm a Christian. I don't have to serve you anymore. I'm off because I belong to the Lord. It doesn't work like that. Paul says, no, you still got a duty to go to work. Imagine if um, Hazel, our administrator, phoned up the church offices on Tuesday um, and Tom answered the phone and Hazel said, hi, I'm not coming in today. And Tom said, uh, why not? Are you ill? Are you okay? And Hazel said, oh yeah, yeah I'm fine. I, I was just doing my quiet time this morning and I came across that bit in Galatians. It says, for freedom, you've been set free so I don't have to come to work anymore. Uh, Tom is likely to go a little bit mental at Hazel because that's not the point. <laughs> you can't just say, hey, I'm a Christian. I don't have to go to work anymore. Paul says, no, 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 you've still got a duty to do your work. So we can't just, uh, I'm not saying on Monday you can just phone up your bosses and go, hey, I'm not coming in. Why not? Because I'm saved. You know, (laughs) it doesn't work like that. We've got a duty to work well. And in fact, Paul goes one stage further. He doesn't say just go to work. He says, serve your masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. He doesn't say just serve your masters. Serve them well, with sincerity of heart, not by way of eye service. That's a an important phrase, not by way of eye service. How tempting is it? I I find the temptation, um, more so in my old job where it was incredibly boring, but (laughs) I find the temptation again and again just to think, hey, no one's watching. I can just chill out for a bit. (laughs) I don't have to work. I can just, you know, surf the web a bit and go on Facebook and change my status to Liam is not working or something. (laughs) That would be a bit of a giveaway. Liam is working hard. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it, we find the temptation all the time to actually wait till your boss isn't looking and then just chill out a bit. And then as soon as he walks around the corner, suddenly a spreadsheet pops up and you go, oh, I'm just so busy, I'm <laughs> overworked. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? It's such a temptation. I've worked in offices with people who, um, who sit there on the phone all day chatting to friends and they're you know, arranging a time to go out to the pub or whatever and suddenly their boss walks around the corner and their tone of voice changes and they go, so I have it on my desk by Thursday. Dolphin at 8 p.m. You know, you know the type. I even hung up the phone. <laughs> it's not real. <laughs> um, people do it all the time in the office, and it, it can be tempting. But Paul says, don't serve just by way of eye service when they happen to be watching you. Serve with integrity of heart. And his challenge to us is we've got to work with integrity in our workplace, whether we're being watched or not. That's the application from this verse. He then goes on. He says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Paul says, whatever work you're doing, do it as if you're doing it for God and not for men. And he gives an incentive and a warning, and they're both based, blah, both based on the fact that God is watching. He gives an incentive and a warning. He says, if you're working hard, know that God is watching and he will reward you. How many people, I, in fact, I, I hazard a guess, I know there are people here who feel undervalued in their workplace. In every workplace, there is someone who, who feels like, I just, my boss doesn't take any notice of me. I work so hard. I see other people being lazy. I work so hard and my boss just doesn't take any notice. I never get a pat on the back. I never get a well done. I never get any kind of commendation or or pay rise. Other people maybe get the praise. I don't at all. It's like my boss just doesn't care about me. He never sees me. I know that is painful. I know there are people here who probably go through that. 
And Paul's incentive to you is this, work as if you're serving the Lord and not men, and rest assured that he sees the good work you are doing and will reward you. Isn't that so encouraging? If you're hard done by in your workplace, don't think I'm just serving this man, I'm serving God. And God sees all the time and will reward you. And I imagine there are people here who are upset. They go to work and they hate it because they just think I'm undervalued. No one cares about me. That's God's word to you today. Take comfort from the fact that God is watching and will reward you. And obviously there are steps you can take to make sure that's you know, uh, changed in your workplace. You can talk to people about that. Absolutely. God is not saying just suffer in silence. But his encouragement to you is he watches. He sees the hard work you do. When you act with integrity, he sees that. And he will reward you. Take heart. But equally, that's the incentive. Equally, there's a warning. Because God sees everything. If you are lazy, (laughs) he knows. And it's very tempting as well to be in your office and think, my boss just doesn't care. You know, maybe he happily knows that people are lazing around on, on the company time, but he just doesn't care. Or maybe your boss is just lax and just doesn't notice. And you think, I know, I can get away with being lazy in the workplace. Know that God is watching. He's watching, and so you've got to serve with integrity of heart. Because even if this man doesn't see you and you think, I can get away with this, I could work for this company for 10 years and never do a day's work, actually God will see all of that. You've got to serve the Lord, not men. That's the incentive and the warning. Does that make sense? Excellent. Whatever you do, no, I've done that bit. (laughs) Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Who in this room is in any form of management? A few people, a few people. To those of you in management, God says you've got to treat the people that you manage justly and fairly. Wherever you are in the food chain, if you're the top boss of your company, actually you've got to know there is one higher than you. Even if in earthly terms you don't think there is, there is always one higher than you. And that's the Lord. And you have to treat your slaves or not slaves, but, you know, people that work for you, you've got to treat them justly and fairly. And the reason is not because Paul just thinks that's a nice thing to do, but because you also have a master in heaven. And your relationship with the people that work for you needs to reflect your relationship with God. And God is so wonderful and glorious and good to you that if you are anything less than wonderful and glorious and good and just and fair to the people that you work over... (laughs) then that's not reflecting the relationship that you have with God. And he says, you've got to treat them justly and fairly because God does that to you. Imagine the picture. You're in here in the middle in management and you think, okay, I'm at the top of my game and these people have to respond to me, but actually you have to respond to God. And here's the perfect manager. He's the perfect master. And you've got to reflect that to the people that you oversee. What a challenge to people in management. Manage people like God manages you. He is gracious, he is just, he is fair. You've got to be as well. What a tall order. (laughs) But this just hints at my third point. You've got to see yourself, managers or masters, as almost slaves to God. You've got got to see your relationship to God in terms of slave and master. Do you ever think of your Christian life in terms of being a slave to God? I know I don't. I very often think of the nice verses. You know, you are a son of God. You're a child of God. You're an heir. You are, um, you know, potter and he is the clay. No, other way around. (laughs) You are clay and he is the potter. (laughs) My theology is nearly as bad as Bartlett's. Um, (laughs) But no one of those metaphors is completely all-encompassing. We need them all, okay? The uh, potter and clay metaphor doesn't describe the whole of your Christian life. There are other ways of understanding it, okay? He doesn't want you to go through your entire life thinking, I'm just a lump of clay, because no, you're a child of God as well. And similarly, he doesn't want you to think I'm a slave, because actually Jesus says, I don't call you slaves, I call you friends. And what he's saying is there, there is not Paul's getting it wrong, but he's saying there are lots of ways of understanding the relationship to God. And here in the New Testament, again and again and again, Paul uses the language of slavery to talk about your relationship to Jesus. And I never think of myself as a slave of God, but I really should. Because of those 124 times in the New Testament where that word doulos is explicitly used, the majority of them are metaphorical. In fact, every one of Paul's letters, apart from two Thessalonians, talks about slavery. And the majority of those times, it uses it like a metaphor. And we don't have time to treat this fully, but I'll, I'll I'll look at it quickly. 
There are loads of passages we could look at. Let's look at Romans 6 (coughs) and just see how Paul begins to use this metaphor of being a slave of God. There are loads of other passages you could look at. I've already talked about uh, 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, There are plenty more. Maybe have a look through your Bible. As you're reading through your Bible, try and find them and uh, and see what God has to say or ask me. I'll recommend a book or or whatever. But let's look at Romans chapter 6. And before we do, just, just to reinforce this again, the reason I spent so long at the beginning is because I know if I got up here and I'd play that video clip and I'd read that passage and I'd say, you know what, you're a slave and Jesus is your master, you'd be operating with this new world mindset. You'd say, what? You're saying that becoming a Christian is like being bundled in a ship against your will, cha- chained up, taken to another nation, worked to the bone and probably dying in the job, poor and mistreated. Are you saying that's what it is to be a Christian? It's absolutely not. Absolutely not. If you've just become a Christian recently, uh, take, you know, take encouragement (laughs) we haven't tricked you into something okay slavery to jesus is a wholly positive thing all the negative connotations of modern slavery are not there at all when paul talks about being a slave to god in fact even the negative connotations of first century slavery aren't there when you talk about being a slave of jesus being a slave of jesus is a wholly completely positive wonderful thing romans 6 Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Sorry, I didn't tell you. It starts at verse 13. Either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin, say say slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Say that, slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you were once present, just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, say slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed the end of those things is death but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God say slaves of God the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life for the wages of sin is but the free gift of God is in Christ Jesus our Lord you ever thought of yourself as a slave of God it's challenging isn't it but essentially what Paul is saying in this passage with some ridiculously long words is basically this there are two masters okay and everyone is a slave to one or other of them there's sin or there's righteousness there's sin or there's God who are you a slave to are you a slave to sin or are you a slave to God who is your master who rules the way you spend your day sin or God. Whether you know it or not, everyone is a slave to one or other of those. Now, I left my job in December and got a new job, and uh, with my new job, everything changes, okay? I don't have to work for my old boss anymore. I don't owe him anything. Uh, I get a different wage. I get a different pension plan. I have a different holiday allowance. I don't get the same perks that I used to in my old job. I work for the government, which means you get random days off here and there, like the Queen's birthday. Uh, Strangely enough, I don't get the Queen's birthday off anymore. That's a shame, but I get different perks because I'm under a different contract. My boss treats me differently. I have a different wage, a different pension plan. I don't have to work for this guy anymore. I work for this guy. And Paul is essentially saying it's like that with sin and Jesus. I'll explain in a second. But just imagine if I just got a bit bored with my current job and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go back to my old office. And I just strolled back and I wandered in. I don't know quite how I get through the security pass, but somehow I just wandered in. Forget that. Leave that out of the metaphor. I get there. I sweep off my desk. Whoever happens to be sitting there, you know, I throw away the pictures of their loved ones, put up a glorious picture of Helen or something like that. I never have one on my desk, but, you know, I might do in the metaphor. I put one up there. I get out my coffee cup. I sit down at the desk. I start doing my old job, tapping away. And everyone else, I mean, some of the people here work at that office you'd probably think I was absolutely nuts <laughs> they'd go hang on well John would probably be annoyed because he's probably got my desk now and I've just swept his picture of Jane onto the floor or something um, but <laughs> imagine all the people looking at me and going what the heck are you doing you don't work here you don't owe us a day's work what do you think you're doing and you just oh, I just fancy working for you for a bit rather than my boss imagine if Tom saw me working in my old office he'd go hang on a second we're paying you to work for us what are you doing over there on our time when we're paying for you you're working for someone else 
That's not right. And what Paul says here is you're either a slave to sin or a slave to Jesus. Serve the one that is your master. Don't go back and do another day's work for your old boss. If you are a slave to sin, in Paul's metaphor, you work hard. You work hard at sin. You work overtime on sin. You sin left, right, and center. You're happy to go in on the weekends and sin because you like sinning. And actually, you work and work and work, and you get your wage slip, and you open it up, and what do you get? Death. That's the wage for all the work you've done. Death. Because if you work for sin, that's the wage that he pays. Death. That's not good. And Paul says you don't work for sin anymore. You work for Jesus, and you work for him. You serve him. You do whatever he tells you to do, and you don't open your wage slip and find death. You open it, and you find life. In fact, you don't open it and find life. You find eternal life, because that's the wage that this master pays. Isn't that incredible? I got a knee tap from Joey. That's amazing. <laughs> Jesus doesn't pay death, Jesus pays life. Not just life, eternal life. Life to the full forever with God. Incredible. I would be an idiot to go back and work for my old boss. And Paul says, don't go back and work for your old master. You're being given life by Jesus now. Don't go back and work for your old master. You don't owe him anything anymore. He says, don't present your members to sin anymore. Don't present your hands and your mind and your eyes and your tongue and your time to sin anymore. You don't have anything to do with him. You are owned by Jesus now. You're a slave to him. Serve him and serve him well. The Bible turns the metaphor of slavery totally on its head and makes it a wholly positive thing when it's in terms of you and God. Slavery to sin, utterly negative. Slavery to God, wonderfully glorious. I thought it was incredible that um, during the worship time, there were so many words about you are Lord, Lord of love, Lord of peace, Lord of life, Lord of everything. You are Lord, I bow down, you are Lord. When you confirm that Jesus is Lord, you are saying that you are the master and I'm not. You're in charge and I'm not. You rule over everything. You reign over my life. You're my Lord. That means I am submitting to you and saying you are God and I'm not and I'm going to do what you tell me. That's what the Christian life is like. You say, God, you are God, I'm not. You are the master and I'm the servant, I'm the slave. I'm going to submit to you and do whatever you tell me. I know that you pay a glorious wage. Guys, if you are a Christian, you're a slave of God. And that means wonderful things. Because it means that you serve a master who will never mistreat you. You serve a master who will never neglect you, who will never overlook you, who will never push you beyond that which you can bear. You serve a master who knit you together in your mother's womb, who knows you intimately, who knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows everything about you, everything you've ever done, everything you will ever do. He sent his son to die for you. That's the kind of master you serve. My boss hasn't sent his son to die for me, but Jesus has. Jesus has come to die for me, to take the punishment that I deserve so that I didn't have to. That's the master that you serve. He is a wonderful and glorious master who has gone ahead of you to make a place for you, who is coming back one day on the clouds of heaven to take you there, to be with God in the new heavens and new earth for all eternity, where you will spend forever worshipping and praising him in total bliss, with no sickness, sin, suffering, pain, nothing negative at all. That's the kind of master you serve if you're a Christian. He's not some second-rate master that doesn't really care if you turn up or not. He's not some second-rate master that makes you work horrible hours, wear yourself out, and then just goes, don't really care. You leave, I'll get someone else. I'll get a 10-pin. He's not like that. Why would you not want to serve a master like Jesus? Why would you not want to serve a glorious master like Jesus? If you're a non-Christian, whether you know it or not, the Bible says you're in slavery as well to sin. And whether you think you are or not, if the Bible's true, and I would say it is, you're in slavery to sin. That means sin is your master. That means you spend all day working for this guy, and in the end, he's going to pay you your wage, and it's going to be credited to your account whether you like it or not, and it's death. It's separation from God forever. I don't want you to work for him. <laughs> I want everyone to be working for this master. He's wonderful, he's glorious. I want to introduce you to him this morning. You work for a master who will never satisfy you. You will never get job satisfaction with this man, ever. You'll get death. <laughs> That's it. Eternity without God. Horrendous. Horrible. And you, there's no way out. There's no way out for you. <laughs> 
You might think, I can't get, you know, I, I can do fine. I can live a good life. Actually, you can't. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. We're all stuck in this horrible trap of being a slave to sin. And your only hope is if someone else, more powerful, more rich than you, can come and buy you out and say, actually, you're going to be my slave now. You don't have to work for that person anymore. And the glorious truth is that Jesus has already done that for you. Remember the verse earlier on in Colossians. It says, he cancelled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. At the cross, Jesus paid the debt that you couldn't pay so that you could get out of this slavery to sin and follow him. What a glorious message. Who wouldn't want to serve this master, this glorious master? You can serve this master. Maybe we could have the band up. Actually, just Rob, maybe, and George on the keys. Would that be okay? I want to give you an opportunity to respond today. If we all just close our eyes, wherever we are, if we could just close our eyes, it's just me looking now, and God. Some people here will know they are slaves to sin. Some people here will know I'm stuck in situations I can't get out of. There's nothing I can do about it. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I can't get out of it. Jesus wants to say, you don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. You can follow me. I'm a glorious master. I'm going to take you to spend eternity with God. Some people will not know that they're stuck in sin. Some people will be stubborn and say, I'm not. I'm going to be fine. I can live my life. Well, in fact, I, I... I just feel that God would say, actually, there are people here who are chained to specific sins. I think there are people here today who are struggling with addictions, uh, who don't know Jesus, and they're struggling with addictions to alcohol and to drugs and to substance abuse. And, And actually, and actually, I feel that, actually, I feel like, you resist God and you say, no, 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 I, I, can, I can break free of this addiction anytime. I can, I can stop. I can stop. I've tried in the past. I've, I've stopped for a little while. If I wanted to, I could just stop anytime. You can't. You need God. You need someone who is far stronger than you, far stronger than your addiction to break you out. Jesus has already done that to you. And if you want to be saved today, if you want to come into a relationship with this master, this glorious master, Jesus, I would encourage you, with every eye closed in this place now, only me looking, and God, Would you respond to him this morning? If you want to become a Christian today, I would encourage you just to raise your hand where you are. That's all there is to it. And then we'll talk about it with you. We'll pray with you. We'll help you. We'll introduce you to this master. If you want to become a Christian today, please just raise your hand now. you want to become a Christian, come forward to the end. We will pray with you. We will talk with you. We will explain more. We'll try and answer your questions. We will help you to meet this Jesus this morning. I feel there are also people here today who may want to respond because they are struggling in their workplace. I think there are probably people here, in fact, you can open your eyes and look at me if you want. There are probably people here who, when I was talking earlier about feeling undervalued in the workplace, there are probably people like that who feel like people don't see any worth in me. They mistreat me in my workplace. If you want to respond, I'm not going to get you to put your hands up now. But at the end, come forward and speak to the ministry team. We would love to pray for you. We'd love to tell you how God sees you. He sees you as a wonderful servant of his. He loves you. Maybe there are people who actually feel convicted of cheating their bosses a bit, (laughs) of being lazy in the workplace, okay? If you want to get that off your chest, you can talk about that with God. If you want to be paid for, prayed for, then come forward at the end and we'll pray for you for that. Actually, I felt as I was preparing that God wanted to say something particularly to students. I know there aren't many of you here today, but students, if you're watching there on the video camera, listen, because I feel that God wants to say to you, You need to serve with integrity in your degree as well. 
And my story is that I came to university my first year, I was fine because I wasn't really stuck into church. My second year, I loved church. I got stuck in totally and I gave my life to the church so much that my grades slipped quite a lot. In my third year, I decided I need to readdress that balance because actually I'm not just serving a guy who oversees my degree. I'm serving the Lord and I've got to serve with integrity. So in that third year, I tried to get that balance right between church and studies and I came up with a good degree in the end, but it's only by the grace of God. And I want you, I wholeheartedly want you students, if you're watching this and if you're here, I wholeheartedly want you to get yourself stuck into the church. I do. I totally do. Okay, I'm not saying stop doing those things. Absolutely do. But Paul's word to you is actually you need to serve with integrity in your workplace, which is your degree. And I know I was effectively sinning when I said, okay, I'm just going to, I'm here. My degree is the the, you know, the means to me being here and the end is that I can serve the church and actually God does want you to serve the church but don't just see your degree as a DOS for three years actually serve well in your degree serve with integrity in your degree because God is watching the same goes for your degree as it does for the workplace if you want to be prayed for come forward and finally the people who feel like they still go back and do a day's work for their old boss sin God would say that doesn't have to be like that. You can be set free. You can get new strength from God today. And if you feel like you want to come and confess sins, okay, you don't have to confess to me. I, I've got no power to forgive you. God forgives you. But if you want to come and be prayed for, then come to the front at the end and we will pray for you. And actually, finally, this isn't in my notes, but if you have heard the testimonies this morning about healing, and maybe you weren't here at the beginning, we had two testimonies of healing, two people set free from eating problems. If you feel like you are bound by sickness and you want to be prayed for, then I'd encourage you to come forward and we'll pray for you to be healed this morning.